morning. Um, wow. Uh, I have three things to apologize about. The, it's a wonderful way to start. <laughs> the, um, the first one is that they ran out of books. So I was told that they searched in the whole hemisphere of Southern California and could not b find any more of these of Rise and Kill Fist, which is a good, good, uh, good news for Random House. Um, but if someone would like to buy the book, I will be signing stickers <laughs> afterwards outside. And uh, I was told to tell you this, and I will be happy to sign it. And then when the book comes, and they order them from the mothership of Random House, and uh, hopefully they will arrive very, very soon. Um, the, uh, the second point, which uh, you need to help me to figure out what to do. Yesterday we had a very, I think, uh, interesting and nice uh, um, uh, uh, speaking engagement or conversation on stage with Brad Stephens, my uh, colleague, great journalist from the New York Times. Um, were you there? Okay, <laughs> here is the problem. <laughs> so question is whether um, we can repeat some of the stories or not, uh, but I'll figure this as, uh, as soon as we start. And the third point is, uh, you know, we Israelis, we are not known to be very much into politically correctness. Sometimes they say we are blunt, we have no clue when it comes to dress code. And every time before I appear in front of non-Israelis, I have this moment uh, wherever in the world, especially in the U.S., puzzling, usually the hotel room, at the closet, thinking, what should I wear? Should I put on a jacket or a tie? Now, you don't want to come to a non-Israeli audience being overdressed or underdressed. So usually I put on a tie. Um, looking at you, <laughs> it, it seems that it was a little too much. <laughs> so for, with your permission, I'll take it off. <laughs> um, the, uh, what, which reminds me of a story I once heard from a guy called Oleg Gordievsky. Gordievsky was the, uh, the KGB station chief in London until in 1984 he came to the conclusion that the KGB is indeed the empire of evil and he defected, he offered his services, he was a walk-in and offered his services to British intelligence and became I think the most important spy of that era. He, by the information he gave, he prevented the Third World War. And after he gave everything he had to British intelligence, he was asked by them, by the MI6, to fly over to Israel as a token of appreciation to, that they gave to Mossad and debrief Israeli intelligence about the KGB attempts to infiltrate Israel. This was 1984. It was, Israel was high on the uh, uh, target list of the KGB. And when I met him years afterwards, Gordievsky recalled that flight and said, the flight from Heathrow to Ben Gurion, and said, there was 747 jumbo jet, first class, on the expenses of Mossad. They were very generous with him. And then I noticed something very odd. The booze were free, but I was the only one drinking. Then when I reached Israel, I realized that this is the country with the smallest number of two things, drunk people and ties. Now, bear in mind, this was 1984. Ever since, we have more ties <laughs> and some more alcohol as well. Um, but it's about ties. So I, I came to speak about this book, Rise and Kill First. This book was published exactly on the year, exactly a year ago. And something like a little bit more than a year ago, we had the 
concluding um, meeting at Random House, New York, and people there were a little bit concerned. They were not very much concerned per the, uh, the content of the book. Um, I think we, we trusted that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the content and the making of that. How do you write a book about the most secretive organization on earth, the Mossad? The concerns were about the audience, about you for that thing. That the book, we realize, does not contain the three main topics that were, and still are in a, in a, in a, in a certain way, at the peak of the interest of the American audience. And there is nothing there. There is nothing about Trump. There is nothing about Me Too. And there is nothing about sexual harassment. There's just nothing. And we were concerned that the book will not sell. So a year later, you see, we have the stickers. We don't have the books. And, uh, and we were happy to be um, wrong with our concerns. And I think that the reason why that happened was because the topics in the book, the, the dilemmas, the experience of Israeli intelligence fighting challenges of national security, threats to the Israeli nation, to the Israeli citizens, are not just ours. They were mainly Israelis, but now they are shared by the whole world. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, and other of these challenges and, and, uh, and threats. I was approached to write the book by Random House in uh, 2010. And they asked me to write a book about the Mossad, the history of the Mossad. And they, uh, um, it was supposed to be a, a general history. I suggested to be a little bit more focused and deal with the one single activity of uh, secret operations that is at the core of the public discourse in Israel, but also in the United States. Targeted assassination. Are they legal? Are they moral? Are they effective? In 2010, President Barack Obama started to use targeted killing much more than President Bush. And doubling, doubling, doubling the number again and again and again. Um, they asked me, how long will it take you to write the book? I said, a year. And I was six years delayed. <laughs> the reason why it took so long was that I decided to completely disregard everything that was written about Israeli intelligence so far. Have you seen Fauda? Fauda, Israeli um, series, TV series about special operation of Israeli intelligence. I had to tell you this, Fauda is not real. It's a great series, but it's not real. Israeli intelligence reality is by far more complicated than anything that you can see in any, any other movie. Why did I write the book? I wrote the book, I think, because of three main reasons. The first is that it is so interesting. Everywhere I go, I can speak about the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, about Daesh, about nuclear issues. But once I start to speak about the Mossad, you see people's eye shine. <laughs> People really want to know how does it work, the Jewish James Bond, the real stuff. <laughs> Second reason is that I believe you cannot get a real understanding of Israeli history without a true reading of Israeli intelligence secret history. This is not a history living in a, in a different world, in a vacuum. There is no single decision, no single development, no single historical change 
in the history of Israel, in the history of the region, and when it's relevant in the history of the whole world, without the participation of Israeli intelligence. They did good, they did bad. Sometimes Israeli James Bond looks more like Inspector Clouseau, but they were involved. And as much as you cannot understand the history of the Second World War without knowing what happened in Station X, Bledgley Park, where they encrypted, decrypted, sorry, the Enigma machine, something that shortened the Second World War in something between two and three years. So as much as you cannot understand the history of the Second World War without understanding what happened in Bletchley Park, you cannot understand the history of Israel without understanding what Israeli intelligence did. It is profound, secretly, but profoundly affecting every turn in Israeli history. And the third reason why I wrote the book was because Israeli intelligence are extremely powerful and they are courageous, and they, are, they do remarkable things, but also they work with very, very little oversight by the institution, by the democratic institutions of Israel. And when the institutions do very little, I believe that we, journalists and historians, have sacred obligation to step in and make sure that whatever these organizations are doing, and they are keeping us safe, there is no doubt about that, but whatever they do need to be in compliance with democracy and with the rules and the laws of the state. In the, um, one of the blurbs that the book was given by Tamir Pardo, the, uh, the last veteran Mossad chief, who retired in 2016, he said, here is the dilemma, this is the, the problem, this is the deliberation that we have been encountering every day in our career in the Mossad. What sort of weapons, what sort of tools, what sort of capabilities are we allowed to use while defending Israeli national security and Israeli citizens while knowing that these weapons might contradict other values of democracy? And at the peak of that, targeted killings. This is the death verdict without a trial that is uh, taking place in the most secretive forum. There's only one person in Israel who's authorized to give an okay for a targeted killing. Have any idea what, who is that person? Only the Prime Minister. They even have a special code name for that. They call targeted killing, they call negative treatment. <laughs> this is from the medical world. And small groups of people come to authorize the operation with the Prime Minister, usually because of secrecy in his private house, uh, the official mention of the Prime Minister. Now, usually, you have the head of the organization coming, but he brings with him the people who know the details. Very young. Most of them under the age of 30. Some of them under the age of 25. Only in Israel. Small place, small family. We know, oh, everybody knows everybody. So you have people, some of them under the age of 25, coming to the Prime Minister, dealing with the most, with the most secretive stuff, coming to convince him to authorize that, that someone is such a great danger to Israeli lives that they should given, given, be given an okay to kill him. And sometimes the same people who came to um, authorize or get the, the okay cross that room and become the prime minister. You know, Ehud Barak, Israeli prime minister, minister of defense, chief of staff, he was leading a group of commandos to kill PLO operatives who were involved in the killing of Israeli athletes in the Munich Olympic Games in 1972. So April 1973, Ehud Barak is leading that, these commandos. And one, in one of the interviews to the book, Barak tells me 
that just before the operation, the chief of staff of that time, he was just a lieutenant, come to them and say, listen, and they were rehearsing the operation in a new neighborhood in, in North Tel Aviv. So he said, look, you are going to be a group of men wandering around at night the streets of Beirut. That looks suspicious. Why don't s few of you be dressed as women? So Ehud Barak was dressed as a brunette, and he put two hand grenades in the bra. Amiram Levine, his deputy, was dressed as a blonde. And when recalling the operation, the operation was very successful, um, and when recalling the operation, Ehud Barak tells me that he came back that night. He was, it was already morning, or almost not morning, dawn in Israel. He was dead tired, so he just fell on the bed. When his wife, and she was still asleep, and she didn't know where, where he is, of course. Um, when she woke up, she found her husband next to her with remains of makeup, lipstick, and remains of a bra, and thought that something odd is happening to her husband. <laughs> People cross that room from being an operative to becoming a prime minister. Only in Israel. Just imagine in the United States, that something of that kind would happen, and the thought, I, I assume, with a public debate that this would, would arise. But again, Israel is very, very different. I decided to disregard everything that was published on Israeli intelligence and start all over again and interview the people that, were, that participated in all the operations. And that took me, all in all, eight years. I interviewed 1,000 people. And when I submitted the, the manuscript to Random House, um, they were already desperate. They thought that they would never see the book. The first thing that they asked me was, why did they speak? All of these people, most of them on the record, spoke about things that they never spoke before. They shared their participation, whether as a decision maker, prime minister, minister of defense, as chiefs of the organization, chiefs of the Mossad or the IDF or the Shin Bet, the Israeli Domestic Secret Service, or shared the information about what they did themselves as operatives and intelligence officers. So why did they speak? They spoke because of various reasons. Um, and I cannot, these are the stories I cannot share. Some, sometimes the stories behind the story uh, are only less interesting, a little bit less interesting than the story themselves. There's a context there. But if there's a common ground, I think that these people, the 1,000 interviews, most of their names are at the uh, list of sources at the end of the book. They shared, they wanted to share, after so long, they wanted to share that information because after so long, they wanted people to know what they have done for Israel. They told me, we are saying to you, we are telling you, we are sharing with you things that we didn't tell our wives. For so long. There was a one, um, one story. Back in 2012, I sat down with a former high rank official at the Air Force. And we were talking about all sorts of stuff for the book. Then he says, Ronan, I'm now going to share with you, just out of the blue, I wasn't prepared. I'm going to share with you the most secretive detail in the history of the Air Force. But before I do that, I want you to promise me that you will not do anything with that information, as tempted as you will be after I tell you the story, Unless you convince that other senior officer that he will get, be on the record with that information. If he's on the record, I am on the record, it's okay. If he's not, you forget about that. Then he tells me a story of how Israel tried to assassinate Yasser Arafat, the chief of the PLO. Numerous times. He was lucky. But not just luck. It was a point in time when Ariel Sharon, who was the Minister of Defense of Israel in 1982, was so obsessive in killing Yasser Arafat that he ordered the Air Force to take down a 
um, an airline containing civilians, in including Arafat, meaning doing something that is manifestingly illegal, and the chiefs of the Air Force, courageous officers, stood firm and said, no, uh, Minister of Defense, we are not going to do that. They declared mutiny in order for not stay in Israel with this kind of crime. You can imagine the extent of the drama, standing firm against this charismatic Minister of Defense. So when he finished, the, when he finished telling the story in a cafe in Tel Aviv, I said, okay, I want to publish it. He said, no, you promised. <laughs> you go to the other officer and you convince him to tell you this. I went to the other officer and said, there is no way. This is the, uh, the other officer was a firm general, like a Prussian um, early 20th century general. There is no way, very tough. There is no way I could convince him. I went to see him in a sky, um, a high sky, skyscraper uh, office in Tel Aviv, looking over a huge room. That's the size of this room for one person. And he was, he was sitting in one side, and we were started to talk about the, the 1982 war in Lebanon, and I just circled around the question that I really wanted to ask. And then I, st and then, and, and this was just, just talks, just small talks before. And then I approached the question, and I said, do you know anything about that? And suddenly his gaze, his, his eye gaze changed. He stood up. He said, you know what? For 30 years, this was 2012, for 30 years I was waiting for someone to come and ask me this question. He said, wait a minute. He crossed that room. He moved the chair. Behind the chair there was a safe. He opened the safe and he brought back the file of that operation which he kept in his position for 30 years waiting for someone to ask him the question. And when you read the book, it's all in chapter 15, when you read the book, you'll see that there are tiny details, like hours, the tail, um, the tail number of that airplane with Yasser Arafat. And you could ask yourself, well, how, how does he know that? I know that because the guy, that general, gave me the file. Including the handwritten notes from the chief of staff ordering him to take down the airplane. Um, six years delayed... I came to uh, a meeting at Random House, New York, and we wanted to find a name for the book. You know, that's the, uh, that stage after finishing a book when you have to have a name. So someone suggested the obvious, License to Kill. <laughs> but it turns out that there are 64 different books <laughs> registered in Amazon called License to Kill. So that is all. Then someone came with an awful idea, that was me, to, ca to call the book The Art of Assassinations, like The Art of War of Sun Tzu. This is awful ideas, you know. And, 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 and Random House said, no, no, this, it looks like a Zen book. We, uh, that's, not, that's not what we are aiming at. And then one person, one of the few who had the, our internal security clearance to actually read the millions of words of transcripts of all these interviews, said, you know what, Ronan? There is one sentence that is repeated by many, many of your different interviewer, interviewees. And of course, they are not connected. They are not synchronized with each other. But they are still repeating the same question, the same sentence. And this, the sentence is a quote from the Babylonian Talmud. Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. Hakam shkem Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. And this is the source for the name of the book, Rise and Kill First. Now, these interviews, they use the, uh, that phrase not in order to show me their... Um, understanding and, and, and well-versed well in the Talmud. They wanted to explain to me their mindset. This was not an apology. This was not an alibi. This was not a justification. They, are not, they were not defending themselves. They were trying to explain to me why have they participated in all this, these operations. Daring and sometimes controversial. Because they did that 
because they wanted to make sure that Israel, Israeli lives and Israel national security is safe. And I think, and I think I also told this to Brad yesterday, when an interviewee was not very enthusiastic to speak, you know, these people, the 1,000 interviewees, they come from the intelligence community. They are trained not to talk. So not all of them were very much elaborating at the beginning. <clears throat> but then I used the trick that makes all Israelis very angry. I told them that someone else took credit for their operation. <laughs> that usually solves any problem. There's nothing. There's nothing that agonizes Israelis more than someone <laughs> taking credit for something that they did. Israel, and I'm trying to, to explain why intelligence is so important. When David Ben-Gurion established the state of Israel and the defense forces of Israel, you know, the IDF was created two days after the state was declared in May 1948. But as early as the 2nd of June, 1948, when the country is in deep, deep war with, with seven different Arab armies. And by the way, Ben-Gurion was one of the only people who truly believed that the Jews will prevail. The CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, predicted that the Arabs are going to slaughter the Jews in two weeks. Ben-Gurion said, no, we will prevail. But he also understood that the country, the poor with, you know, so a little uh, resources, no export. You know, Israel in 1948 was exporting oranges in f for $5 billion a year. That's that. That was the only Israel export back then. Just imagine what sort of magic that we have been witnessing with Startup Nation now. But with very little resources, with all the remains of the Holocaust coming in, with the, with the need to establish a state, he realized, Ben-Gurion realized that you cannot sustain long-term war. And another thing, that Israel, that Israeli army, which is based more, mainly on the reserves, cannot be stationed on Israeli borders 365 days a year. So instead of having that army, once winning the independence war, he wanted to have a strong intelligence community, which he established on June, 2nd of June, 1948. The intelligence community is supposed to do a few things. One of them, the first one, is to bring alerting information from the adversary that the Arabs are going to launch a preemptive strike on Israel. Give the reserve, in, the reserve duty forces enough time to mobilize to the front. Now, bringing information from the adversary, his abilities, his intention, this is not extraordinary when you deal with, with intelligence agencies. They do that. But Israeli intelligence is different. Israeli intelligence is, does something, one thing more than most other intelligence services in the, in the West. Again, I hate to break the news, but James Bond is not real. There is no double O program in MI6. Nada. If they, do, if they want to do something of, I would say, of an active or aggressive kind, when they do, which is very rare, they approach the military. In Israel, it's, it's a totally different situation. The Mossad, the full name of the Mossad, Mossad is, stands for Hebrew... Um, word of the institution, the institute. But the full name is the Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations. By its name, you understand that this organization has a different task. It needs to bring information, but also translate the information into special operations way beyond enemy lines. Planting viruses, sabotage, targeted killing. The purpose of that is to prolong the time between the wars, if not prevent the next day war. Israel wants to do whatever it can to prevent a war, not going to a war. Mayor Dagan, the legendary Mossad chief um, who died in 2016, shortly before that he gave a series of interviews to Rise and Kill First, and he told me the triumphant victory of the Six-Day War would not repeat itself. 
we should go to an all-out war only when the sword is on our neck. We should do whatever we can to satisfy ourselves with these special operations. Ben Gurion objected the use of targeted killing. And I think he advocated a empowered use of dem diplomacy until the end of 1945, when the news from Europe started to come in, when the extent of the massacre, the genocide, was becoming clear. And Ben-Gurion changed. And he, when becoming prime minister in 1948, he was saying to his subordinates, I was only one year old when Ben-Gurion died, so I did not have the uh, opportunity to interview him, unfortunately. But I interviewed many of his, his assistants and, and aides, including Shimon Peres and others. And all of them quoted Ben-Gurion in saying to them what kept him awake at night. He said, you know, we have a lot of things to worry about, but one thing keeps me awake. The fact, the fear that I, ben, David Ben-Gurion, brought to Israel the remains of the Holocaust. And here in Israel, they will face a second annihilation. This is the thing that led Ben-Gurion, establish the intelligence community, establish the IDF, establish the nuclear reactor in Dimona. You know, Israel has a nuclear reactor in Dimona where, according to non-Israeli publications, Israel has nuclear weapon, which is called the policy insurance, insurance policy of Israel. When it was erected in 1962, the chief of the project, Shimon Peres, ordered the people to put a huge sign saying, Dimona Textile Factory. Um, then um, Americans already had espionage satellites over Dimona. And suddenly they saw something very odd is happening in the Dimona Textile Factory because someone was digging a very big and deep hole in the ground, 150 meters, and then covering it, which is not typical to textile factories. Um, but Ben-Gurion was positioning himself to address the trauma of the Holocaust. Mayor Dagan, the legendary Mossad chief, when he came to office in 2002, he put a black and white picture on the wall behind him of a religious ultra-Orthodox Jew standing on his knees with his hand in the air, just minutes before, before he is uh, murdered by, by the Gestapo. The father of Mayor Dagan, who fled that village, Lokov in Poland, came back after the war one of, and met one of the neighbors. And the neighbor said, you know, the Nazis ordered me to take a film, to take pictures of what they were doing. And they didn't ask me the film, do you want the film? He developed the film, and to his horror, he finds pictures of his father. And Dagan used to point that picture to everybody coming to visit him and said, you see this picture? This is my grandfather, and I am here as the Mossad chief, and we are here to make sure that this will never happen again. There will never be a second annihilation. And the Mossad and the other Israeli intelligence forces were there to, to take care of that. Israel was, and going back to the use of targeted killing, Israel was um, dividing its target inst into three groups. Leaders, proliferators of weapons of mass destruction, and terrorists. Now leaders, it turns out, Israel was very hesitant to assassinate leaders. Now, you think, about they, you, you think about history. You think about what would happen if someone was able to kill Hitler 
two years earlier. You start to imagine, maybe the world would look different. Maybe millions of Jews could have been saved. That's true. But it turns out from the Israeli experience, the Israeli experience, which is the biggest in the world in, target about, in the use of targeted killing, that killing a leader might alter history, but you don't necessarily know what will happen. So, in 1992, Israel, for the first time, 2nd, 12 of February 1992, Israel, for the first time, used drones to kill someone. You know, now we, we see it in all the movies. Drones are part of targeted killing uh, by Israel, by the United States, by other countries. But in 1992, this was a, a technological miracle. Israel killed the Secretary General of Hezbollah, someone called Sheikh Sen Abbas Musawi. Now, this was, from an operational and intelligence point of view, done remarkably. In fact, Robert Gates, who was then the chief of the CIA, later on the U.S. Secretary of Defense, told me when he saw the video that Mossad brought to him of that assassination, he started to push for the development of the Predator. Because he said, wow, they, I didn't know that drones can do such things. But it turns out also that the person who was appointed to succeed Musawi, someone by the name of Hassan Nasrallah, you know the name, who is now the Secretary General, who was only 31 at that, that time, was by far more extreme, more Jew-hater, and more powerful and capable than anything Musawi was. And he uh, transformed Hezbollah to be the main adversary of Israel, by far more stronger than anything it was under Musawi. By the way, Golda Meir was very hesitant to kill leaders. In 1970, the Mossad approached her and said, we wish to kill Nasser of Egypt. Nasser of Egypt that was called the new Hitler, who said, I'm going to destroy every target south of Beirut. And they said, we can take him out in Tripoli on the 2nd of September 1970. He will be sitting on stage with Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who is going to celebrate the, the first year anniversary of his revolution. You know, he outcast King Idris in 1969, and then he wanted to celebrate and invite a lot of Arab leaders, including Yasser Arafat and Nasser. So Mossad wanted to explode that stage and kill them all. And Golda Meir said, no, stand down. I am afraid that if we kill Nasser, this will legitimize killing Israeli leaders. So they didn't, but they did send the, 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 the team to point out snipers and do nothing, just to show that they, they can do that. Golda Meir's order saved um, Nasser 20 Six days, because he died of natural causes on the 28th of September. You don't really know. Um, I wish to leave some time, uh, some, uh, uh, time for Q&A as, 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 as much as I can address them. But someone, before coming in, someone uh, that is here today, asked me to tell you what I see as the greatest story of the book. Um, and you know, the great, I think that the, the most dramatic moment in, in the book is, the, is a moment that is not part of the special operation and assassination, as, as, as luring as they are, as tempting and sexy as they are. Um, but this belongs to the main artifacts of Mossad, the main, uh, the main craft of what the Mossad does. And the Mossad, usually, you know, we talk about special operation and... You just heard probably the Mossad stole the Iranian nuclear archive under the noses of the Ayatollah regime. Remarkable thing, Ocean Eleven stuff. <laughs> but what they really do most of the time, and maybe this could come as a surprise, but what they do most of the time is turning people, convincing people to betray the country or the organization. Now imagine what sort of capability you need to have in order to convince someone to turn against everything he or she cherish. His family, his organization, his commanders, his subordinates, 
his country, his, his military, his intelligence service. The betrayal manual. And the Mossad perfected that to the level of art. And how did they do that? They do it by, they do it by deploying two different tactics at the same time. First, being very understand, understandable into the human character. What do you need to do in order to penetrate someone's mind and be his brother and his father and his psychologist and his lover? Whatever you need to do just to convince him to tell you what he's not authorized to tell. And doing that while assuming false identity. Because it turns out, which is you know, quite obvious, that it's much easier for a Syrian general to betray his country if he speaks with someone who is not Israeli. You know, Israel is uh, the worst enemy. If someone comes to a Syrian general and says, I am from the Mossad, please, could you tell me your secrets? <laughs> well, you know, it might work, but probably not. But if someone says, I am a French businessman, we are handing over, we are submitting a bid in Damascus for purification, purification of water. We just want your help. And we will pay. It, you know, it's not that horrendous. It doesn't, the person betraying doesn't think he's betraying anything. And when he understands, he's too deep inside, already receiving money, etc. So, being someone else, being very manipulative, this is what Mossad case officers are doing. Many, many, many thousands of times throughout history when they want to turn someone. But I was just about to tell you about the most dramatic moment in the book. And that moment is one of these rare cases when they do come to someone, said, we are from the Mossad and we want you to work for us. And that moment was hard, especially because of the identity of the target. Because the target was no one else but an SS general. How do you convince an SS general to help the Jewish state? And I don't want to spoil your reading. It's all in chapter 5. <laughs> and I'm going to sign the stickers afterwards. But I will tell you this in brief. 1962, the annual anniversary day for the um, Egyptian revolution, July 1962, Nasser shocks the Mossad when he parades in the streets of Cairo surface-to-surface -surface long range ballistic missiles and says, I am going to use these missiles to destroy al Haya al-Sahyuniya, the Zionist entity. He didn't even want to say the word Israel. So he said the Zionist entity. And the Mossad didn't know anything about it. And when they started to learn more details, they found out to their horror that there were no other than Nazi scientists who used to work for Hitler who built the V1 and V2 in Pinamunda in the Baltic Sea during the war. On Wednesday, we had a wonderful presentation just about that. They, after the war, were left with no job. Some of them were recruited for a little time in, to the United States, then re returned to, to Germany. In Germany, they had no, no work, and NASA recruited them at the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s to develop a fleet of surface-to-surface -surface long range ballistic missile they will destroy Israel. And imagine when this was published, imagine the hysteria in Israel. Scientists who used to work by an SS Gestapo factory in Pinamunda during the war for Hitler are now working for Nasser to destroy Israel. Here we go again. The Mossad was trying to kill them and failed. They killed some of them, but Nasser was offering too much money for the others and it was luring enough and tempting enough to have them stay in Cairo. It led to the downfall of the chief of Mossad, to the resignation of David Ben-Gurion, who was criticized by the opposition that he is signing you know, the reconciliation with Germany, receiving compensation while Germany is turning a blind eye on the fact that their scientists are working for Nasser. Then a new chief of Mossad came and said, we need to stop the assassinations, we need to recalibrate. We need to really understand what the Germans are doing for the Egyptians. We need to have an, an, a, some, some agent, someone inside the project that would brief us what exactly are they doing. 
So how do you recruit a Nazi? Then a, a young Mossad case officer came of a German born who lost all of his family in the Holocaust and said to his boss, Chief, I have a solution for you. And he said, okay, what's that? He said, there is a guy, his name is Otto Skorzeny. He was the chief of special operations for Hitler. He is not a scientist, but he's very close to the scientists. I think if we, you, if we Mossad, recruit him, we will get to them. So the Mossad chief said, you are going to, you want to recruit this Otto? He said, yes, boss, but there's a little problem. He said, in addition for being, him being an SS general and the commander of special operation for Hitler, what's the little problem now? He said, the little problem is that he's a war criminal, a declared war criminal. He participated, he was commanding the SS battalion in Kristallnacht in Vienna. He killed many Jews and burned synagogues. He fled the Nuremberg trial, found refuge with um, Franco in Spain. And the Mossad chief said, you want to recruit this Otto? He said, yes, I think I can get to him. He said, you know, be my guest. We don't have anyone else. You can play your game if you want. But you will be able to recruit this Nazi when I'll have hair growing up here. <laughs> Not spoiling your read, but trying to, but trying to give a, a gist of the story. This young case officer from a person to a person moved and met with a series of people, ending up with meeting the wife of Otto Skorzeny, Countess Ilsa von Finkelstein, the niece of the Treasury Secretary for Hitler. Now, Ilsa and Otto had what I think could be described as, nowadays, open marriage. You understand what I'm talking about, yes? And the case officer, I'm looking for words here, the case officer sacrificed himself. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? Yes, good. So I won't need to elaborate more. The Mossad file, the Mossad report on the incident, uh, they had a many hundreds of pages report on the whole affair, uh, the whole do the dossier about the German scientist in, in Egypt, top secret which is quoted in the book, and um, um, they say about the case officer, he was young, charismatic, tall, with a known influence on women at a certain age. Whatever that means. And they spent, he and the countess, long nights together. After which, she takes him to see Otto Skorzeny, her husband, in Madrid. And after a few hours of discussion, where the case officer even brought the fact that he knows that Skorzeny was part of Kristallnacht. We just sell, you know, uh, marked the 75th anniversary for that. Happens the unbelievable. That Mossad case officer didn't pretend to be anyone else. He knew that this is a, an intelligence trained intelligence officer. He knew that he will never be able to bluff him. Yeah, I know. Two minutes. He knew that he will never be able to bluff him. And he told him, I'm from the Mossad and I want you to work for us. And then happens the unbelievable. The Mossad recruits Otto Skorzeny to be a Mossad agent. Because they could offer him something that nobody else could. Life without fear. This was four years after Eichmann was traced down, abducted and executed. And Skorzeny knew that he's next. And in return for his services, he provided the Mossad, or Mossad provided him with a new Austrian passport, a lot of money, um, and a new the documentation and whatever he needs. And a letter of immunity from Prime Minister uh, uh, Levi Eshkol. And Skorzeny performed remarkably. He solved the problem of the German Nazi scientists in Egypt and became the most valuable spy the Mossad had at that era. Unbelievable story. Now, they marked that I don't have any time, so I just wanted to thank you. So, I, thank you so much. Yeah.